Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to you from Tokyo. I would like to welcome all our attendees. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And I would like to especially welcome our speakers. Let me introduce them briefly. Tomoko Yamanojo Chalvers, the Business Development Manager of Open Research Consultant, Taylor & Francis, and Atole Gata, Research Integrity Manager, Taylor & Francis. I'm Yudita Rika Magyar, country representative of Europe South Japan. And yes, you've guessed it. It's a webinar in collaboration with Taylor & Francis. The title of today's webinar is Research Integrity and Open Research Benefits and Real World Impact. So what will you be able to take away from this session? All in all, we would like to introduce you to publishing ethics, including an overview of the common types of issues. For example, the role that publishers play, the editors work, how to ensure that there is an integrity in the scholarly record, what kind of authors, when, you know, what kind of information authors need to know in order to avoid problems. This session will provide a brief introduction to open research publishing and an overview on the when, why, and how we can issue a retraction notice, a correction notice, an expression of concern notice, and so many more. So I would like you to listen to our first speaker. The title of his presentation is Research Integrity and Open Research Benefits and Real World Impact. Let me just say a few words about him. He's a research integrity manager in the publication ethics and integrity team at Taylor and Francis. He holds a PhD in innate immunity from CDFD in India and has a postdoctoral experience in immunology from the University of Cambridge. So at all, if you're ready, please yeah. share your screen and you're very much looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Atul Gata. I'm a research, like Judith said, I'm a research integrity manager in the publishing ethics and integrity team at Keller and Francis. And today I'm going to speak to you about how open research and research integrity are intertwined and what benefits and impact on the real world they can have. Well, uh, first of all, um, we, I'll go through what is publication ethics, who is responsible for this, who guides this, then we'll go through what kind of common issues do uh, that come up in publication ethics. Then we'll talk a bit about open research and how publication ethics and integrity are linked to each other. Then we'll talk about when there are issues present in a manuscript, what is the purpose of uh, uh, issuing um, post-publication notice like uh, correction, expression of concern, and so on and so forth. And then I'll provide you a few tips on how to avoid such problems and issues uh, when you're publishing. So coming to publishing ethics or publication ethics. So ethics in general refers to a set of moral guidelines that govern any particular activity. And in this case, uh, publishing. And it is very important in, in, in um, it is very important because it controls or it uh, and it um, ensures integrity of the work that is being published. Um, it also ensures that the audience who read this uh, research or read this published literature have faith and trust in the uh, published uh, in, in the material and also allows people to build upon, use this published um, uh, literature as the source and basis of their future work and uh, further studies. And it is very important that these things are maintained because in today's day of uh, you know fake news and AI and you know you really something that you read you can't really trust. So it's very important that we uh, ensure that trust integrity is maintained in published literature. And it is not only the responsibility of one entity; it is the combined responsibility between authors, publishers, and societies. So some of the common issues that come up in publication ethics include, and I'm not going to name all of them, but some of the important ones that we tend to see a lot are authorship issues, uh, competing interests, plagiarism or text overlap, um, paper mills, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on, duplicate submission, data integrity issues, to, to name a few. 
So we'll go through a few of the important ones as we go along. The first one that I want to discuss is authorship. Now, who qualifies for an authorship on a paper? Well, any individual that has contributed to the paper in any way, say for example, they've designed the study, they've written the draft, they have um, executed the study, they have carried out the data acquisition and analysis and reviewed the article. They fall in the category of people who are eligible for authorship. Um, they must have, all authors must have agreed uh, to the journal that it, it's being submitted to. They must have reviewed and agreed on all the changes in the manuscript throughout the publication process, right from submission of the first draft to the revisions and to the proofing of the article. And all authors, when they are listed as an author on a manuscript, they take account, they are accountable and take responsibility for the content of the article. Um, and this is why, because they must be ready to answer any uh, questions that might arise during the review process or after the article is published about the work carried out in the manuscript. And it comes to authorship comes with legal responsibilities because the corresponding author actually signs a legally binding pub author publishing agreement on behalf of all the authors. And I'm going to talk about this a bit more detail later on. Sometimes we acknowledge, sometimes authors acknowledge people in, in their manuscript for some of, uh, for something that has, they have contributed to, but for before doing that, they must take um, permission from the individual so that whether they want to be named in the acknowledgement section or not, because uh, they might have their own reasons not to be named, personal reasons, political reasons. They might think that, you know, it is, it is better to clarify this early on so that there's no confusion that somebody might say, if I'm being uh, asked, if I'm being named in the acknowledgement section, then I should be an author on the paper. So to avoid any kind of scenario like this, it's better to take their permission and confirmation before naming them in the acknowledgement section. There's another part that I want to mention here. Sometimes, we, you know, we depend upon third parties to carry out some part of the study like data acquisition or analysis. And if this has been done in the article, then that needs to be clearly stated. Also, if help from medical scientific writers or translators has been utilized for the, for the publication of the manuscript, then that also must be stated. Um, and when there is a dispute, we often come across this authorship dispute when people talk about that I should have been an author or something on that line. It's, it is something that cannot be resolved by publishers and editors. It is something that the author, all the authors must come to a consensus about. Oftentimes we feel, if we see that the Institute needs to be involved in this, uh, in this uh, dispute. And if the manuscript has not been published, it's still in the process of being published, then it cannot go any further till this authorship dispute is sorted. And only once there is a consensus among all the authors, only then the manuscript moves ahead. The next topic that I'm going to discuss is uh, competing interest. Now, Competing interest is described as any financial, legal, commercial, or professional relationship with any organizations or people who might have an influence on your research. And it is important that any association with others, which might be perceived as competing interest by the audience should be uh, explained in the article. And competing interests can be financial, they can be non-financial. When I say financial, they might be something like um, um, they have been, they have, the authors have received grants from an entity um, um, paid to the author organization. They have patents uh, by the patents are held by the authors or the institutes or the funding organizations, uh, stock or share ownership. And when I say non-financial, it could mean that you know, for example, political, uh, personal, religious, and other kind of uh, competing interests which are perceived to be relevant to the published content or somebody who might be at a benefit or a disadvantage uh, with regards to the outcome of the study. Um, next, I'm going to talk about um, ethical approval for research uh, and key declarations. And this is mainly important when you're talking about human or animal research. So it terms to animal research or research involving cell lines or microorganisms or stem cells or plants, then it is a few things are important to be considered. First of all, is you need to have an ethical approval. If you do not 
have an ethical approval, then you need to state that whether a, a waiver has been granted or who, who decided that ethical approval is not required. You have to state, the authors need to state the sources of these organisms. Say, for example, if you have uh, sourced the cell line from ATCC or you have sourced the animals from a particular a company and they're being housed in a certain uh, part of the institute, then that needs to be stated. Microorganisms, plants, you know, seeds, they need to be established that the plants that you're taking are actually the plants that you say they are. Um, and for example, with an, in animal studies, one thing is very critical that uh, there are humane endpoints that need to be considered for animal studies. And when I say humane endpoints, what I mean is the animal should not be made to suffer for the sake of the study. Say, for example, you're carrying out an infection study and you need to observe the animals for 20 days. But if you feel that the animal's health is deteriorating after the first seven days, then they need to be uh, culled or sacrificed in a humane way so that they don't suffer and they, and they don't, you know, their suffering is not extended just because you need the study to go on for 20 days. Also the housing and animal welfare, you know, sometimes you, you subject them to surgery and other procedures. So the pain management, welfare, and how they are kept in healthy en environment, that needs to be specified. If there are any biohazards that are being uh, used, you know, for example, you're talking about a virulent pathogen, then that needs to be uh, highlighted and appropriate uh, approvals must be stated. When it comes to clinical evidence with regards to human research, then again, ethical approval is important. Informed consent is important, whether the uh, participants have uh, understood the project, understood the study, and have um, given their informed consent. Sometimes consent to publish is also required. I'm going to talk about that later. Then you're talking about uh, if, there have been, if there are vulnerable populations. Say, for example, there are participants who cannot make an informed decision about giving consent, then their next of kin, uh, you know, some, their legal representative needs to provide that. For example, if there are uh, children involved be, uh, below a certain age, then their parents or legal guardian need to provide uh, informed consent. And if there is any data sharing or any data sets that, has, that are involved, then they need to be stated as well. And informed consent in human research especially is very, very important because um, it, needs to be, it, it needs to be really clarified in the manuscript that informed consent has been taken. And for, it is usually, um, it includes studies which are prospective, whether you have taken interviews of including health professionals, focus groups, samples taken prospectively from the participants, and like I said, parental or guardian consent for kids or children under the age of under a certain age. Um, and this has needs to be specified that whether it is written informed consent or is it verbal consent. And if it is verbal consent, then it needs to be specified how was it recorded. So. What I'm trying to say here is if informed consent is highly necessary in, uh, in human research, and if it is taken, then it needs to be uh, stated in the article that um, whether, whether it is written or whether it is verbal, and if it is verbal, then how was it recorded? Next, we, uh, we are going to talk about consent to publish, and this is very, very important when you have case studies or studies which can lead to identification of the patient or the participant. For example, their age, gender, diagnosis, treatment, other things. And this might be the identifying features might be via photos or scans or videos or audio recordings. So it is very important to take consent from the participant or the next of kin that they understand that they might be identified through these features and whether they consent for these things to be published. Next, I'm going to talk about duplicate submissions and publications. And this is very important because it is, it is necessary that one, we cannot submit an article to two journals at the same point in time. And this must be declared when you're submitting your manuscript to a journal that the manuscript is not, has not been submitted elsewhere, is not under a consideration at any other place. And if you remember, I talked about a legally binding authorship, author publishing agreement, and this needs to be signed. And this is where it is. It has to be stated that the manuscript is not under consideration or not submitted elsewhere. And this is signed by the corresponding author on behalf of all the authors. And the reason why this is very, very important um, is because it leads to, you know, it, it, it's just a waste of resources for the same article to be reviewed at two different places at the same time. 
when is duplicate submission okay this is duplicate submissions are okay when is it, if it is a data presented at a conference they're short abstracts and you're publishing the large scale article at a different place if your article has been posted in a repository at a university or if it's on a preprint server like bioarchive and research square and those sort or if the article was published in another language and uh, this needs to be published in a different one and this is at the editor's discretion so uh, which version is the translation, which version, version is the original, who translated the article, they must be named, and the author should check whether there are any copyright or reuse restrictions on the original article. The important thing here is transparency. So if the article has been, if these criteria are there, then the author must specify, the authors must specify that this has been presented, this has been presented, this has been posted, or this has been published in a different language somewhere else. That needs to be the key, transparency. For example, we had a case uh, regarding a duplicate publication that I'm going to talk to you about. So there was an article that was published in the journal A. There were, we were alerted to the editors of uh, and the, the readers or the audience alerted the editor to the existence of the same article in a different journal. And when the two, when the two articles were assessed, they found out that the article the title is the same, the author listed the same, and the article was submitted to journal A three weeks after journal B. The authors were asked for an explanation regarding this and were, uh, and were reminded that they had signed the author, author publishing agreement which said that the manuscript is not under consideration elsewhere. The authors came back with the explanation that there was some miscommunication between themselves and they didn't know who was the corresponding author and it ended up going to two different places. They could not provide a sufficient explanation as to why this uh, error happened or they did not inform the journals because they, when they received the peer review reports, they must have realized that it is the same article. So because of all of this, the article was retracted from journal A because it was the second version. Now we are going to talk about plagiarism or text recycling. Plagiarism is basically the appropriation of someone else's work, ideas, data, figures without giving their, their due credit. This can include content not only from manuscripts or articles, but can also include from books or websites such as you know, blogs. And this is when this happens, it is usually detected by plagiarism detection software such as Authenticate. And whenever we receive any concerns regarding alleged plagiarism or text overlap, then we do our due investigation on it. There's another form of plagiarism, which is self-plagiarism or text recycling. This happens when somebody uses their own work in an excessive manner, you know, like text, figures, ideas, et cetera. And this leads to redundant publication. And this is particularly damning because it skews the publication record towards one side. And as with plagiarism, any concerns that have been raised to us regarding these kind of issues that is self-plagiarism, we do our new investigation. To explain in detail, of, so sorry, before I go there, there is a resource that you can look up. This is called Text Recycling Research Project, which tells you the ethical way of reusing your own data um, appropriately. Um, I provided the link here for your client perusal. So if you feel free to go through it to, um, for any more clarifications. Now I'm going to talk about a case that we encountered, which involved um, text recycling or self plagiarism So we checked a man upon submission, the editorial team checked the manuscript on Authenticate and found huge overlaps, text overlaps with the previous article submitted by the same authors. And the text overlap was not only limited to methods, but also went into results and production figure legends. You know, there's some parts of the data from the tables that are identical. And when the article was considered as a whole, that if you take out all the overlap, all the material that is overlapping with the previous article, there was no novel finding, nothing novel that was present in the manuscript under some consideration. So ultimately the article had to be rejected because of this. Um, next, I'm going to talk to, you must have heard about the term paper mills and what are they and why they are so, uh, so much a threat to the publishing industry. Now COPE or the Committee on Publication Ethics talks about paper mills as the process by which manuscripts are manufactured and submitted to a journal on behalf of authors for a fee so that they get a quick way of publishing many papers, or it is put up on a dodgy website as authorship for sale. 
Um, and this is particularly concerning because most of the time, the research that is published as a part of a paper mill article is fraudulent. It, it is not genuine research that is being published. And there are some flags that we have over the years we have identified in these uh, paper mill articles, but I would like to reiterate that presence of one such flag is not an indicate, definite indicator of a paper mill. It's a combination of all these flags, which leads us to believe that this might be a potential paper mill article. They might include, like if it's a human or animal study, then ethical approval has not been stated properly, or it has been, it is overlapping with another study by a different group of authors and a completely different discipline. How informed consent was taken has not been specified. There might be inappropriate authorship changes, you know, addition or removal of large, uh, large number of authors. There might be inconsistencies in the methodological details. You know, some of the methods don't make sense. They're glaring omissions, which are required for the reproducibility and validate, uh, validation of the study. Uh, there might be data integrity issues, like some of the data analysis or the images that have been used in the article, they are, they are not correct or they have been, their concerns regarding these articles have been flagged on external websites such as Popier, Traction Watch, and on platforms such as Twitter. Um, one such flag that we tend to see a lot often uh, is image manipulation. And I've included this image on the side of a motocross bike on waves, which I think is not possible. So um, image manipulation is very concerning because it compromises the integrity of the presented data. And according to a report in late 2021 in Nature, one fifth, um, one fifth of all publications, life sciences, that is all life sciences publication, have at least one digitally altered image, which is frightening. And the concern is that this, these kind of manipulations and uh, alterations are not only now limited to life sciences, but they're slowly making their way into physical sciences and chemical sciences as well which is why the advent of tools or softwares that can detect such manipulations and the, the, you know, the development of uh, image experts, people who can pick up these inconsistencies, inconsistencies and can flag them uh, has, been, uh, there has been growing in number. I've included an example of a figure that I personally, when I was doing a check on a manuscript, I found that these two images, all, they're identical but they had been used to represent two different result out, uh, results or outcomes in two different panels of a manuscript. So completely different figure panels, but the same image had been put up for both. Um, now we have discussed about the common issues that arise in publication ethics, so authorship, duplicate submission, uh, competing interest, uh, paper mills and data integrity issues. Now I'm going to talk about open research and how it can, you know, to some extent circumvent all these problems that we tend to see. So open research or open science as it's widely known is nothing but the, it's a set of principles and practices that make sure that the scientific research from all different disciplines are freely accessible to everyone in an inclusive manner for the benefit of science and society as a whole. And it is very, very critical for publication ethics, especially because what it does is it allows for open dissemination of research within the audience. And when that happens, it allows for higher scrutiny of the published material. Higher scrutiny more often than not leads to higher quality of research output. And this high quality of research output creates an accessible and validated source of research, which then allows for um, which then allows for people to use that as the building block for their studies, you know, starting point for their own research. Or if they want to reproduce the exact same thing to in a different system, it helps them. And this information is then again, you know, uh, distributed among the larger audience and the cycle kind of acts in a feed forward loop. So you can understand why this would be a benefit to publication ethics because it allows for, it allows open dissemination of information, which can be scrutinized and uh, discussed on and can be validated among a larger audience, hence leading to a lack of the issues that we discussed before. Now we've dealt with the problems that arise. We dealt with how open research can contribute to the removal of some of this, but when these issues do exist and when these problems do uh, are present in an article, what steps can be taken to uh, remove them? So, to ensure the integrity of the scholarly record, there are two ways that this can be done. One is correction, another one is retraction. 
And in some rare cases, we might need to go for an expression of concern or in very drastic cases, removal. And I'm going to talk about which situations would lead to this. So the key point here to remember is these, these post-publication notices are permanent and are linked to the article. And the purpose of these, post, of these notices is to correct the scholarly record, not to point fingers at anyone. So correction happens when there is no serious breach of publication ethics. It is usually done to correct minor errors, which do not have any outcome on the conclusions reached in the article. And there is no overall concern in the integrity of the article. And an example of this is this one. So the, po the point highlighted in red is a correction, typical correction notice that you would see in Taylor and Francis. The next one is retraction notice. Now this happens when there is a severe concern, a severe issue with the, date, uh, with the integrity of the article, which has been, it could be duplicate publication, plagiarism, unethical research. And this can be two types. Either the concern is raised to the publisher of the journal to say that there is a there is an issue with the article, or the authors might come up themselves and say, actually, we looked at our paper, we looked at our data, and we found that there is a concern. When the authors themselves realize that there is a concern, it is always good to in, instigate that because there's a, this is an honest, honest mistake. Sometimes when we reach out to authors and institute and say that there is a concern, could you kind of clarify and the authors do not reply back or the institute does not reply back. And if we have sufficient evidence to say that the integrity of the article has been compromised, then we can take uh, steps to retract the article. And again, the content of the notice is factual. It is only to correct scholarly record. This is not to point fingers or to blame anyone. And the original article stays online, but there's a watermark of retraction uh, retracted across it. Uh, this is an example of the of an article which which shows that it is the editors and publisher who are both jointly taking the decision to retract the article. And you know, in this case, we reached out to the authors. The authors checked their data and they confirmed that the, yes, there were errors present, and they agree with the retraction of the article and they apologize for this oversight. Next is the expression of concern. Now this happens when the investigation that is being carried out is inconclusive. We can't come to any definitive conclusion, but we do think that there has to be a public expression of concern that is required so that readers are aware that there is a concern regarding the article. And we really need to think about it because this is, like I said before, these are permanent notices. The authors, as with the other ones, the authors are informed and the purpose is to alert the readers that while the investigation is going on and while we are still looking into it, there are concerns regarding the data or the integrity of the article. So please interpret, uh, uh, interpret the paper at, um, with a hint of caution. And this is an example of an expression of concern that we um, tend to publish in articles in, at Taylor and Francis. Like in this case, the authors had not responded to our queries regarding the data. And so within the requested timeframe. So as we continue to evaluate uh, the issues within the article, we it was, we thought it was necessary that we post this um, on the article. Now, removal. So re there, often people tend to get a little bit uh, confused between removal and retraction. What is the difference? Removal is the complete removal of the article from the pub published literature. And this can only happen whether there is any defamation on there, any legal concerns, or it has been subject to a, a court order. There is a high risk of harm if this is acted upon, or there is a breach of privacy. And the removal notice goes online, outlining the reasons why the article has been removed and the original article is completely taken down from the uh, online platforms. And here is another example where the editors and the publishers have withdrawn the article or removed the article from the online uh, platform due to legal reasons. I wanted to present this image to everyone because since um, 1997, and you know there was a, there was a study published in Science in October 2018, which talked about how, as we have gone along, how retractions and what percentage of that is fraudulent research has been going on. As a, and as you can see from the figure, as we have progressed to 2015, and I'm sure the the image has gone up and far more than now, is that we are seeing more and more retractions, and we are seeing more and more. Um, fraud that is coming up. And this is because of so many different things. Um, 
the next part that I want to focus on is to provide tips uh, to avoid these issues that I talked about. So plagiarism, authorship disputes, ethical considerations, and those kind of things. So first one is authorship. So it is very important to, in the first scenario, to agree that who uh, should be, who all should be listed as an author on the manuscript. Ensure that everyone who meets the criteria that I talked about in the beginning have been listed as authors. And you have to understand the responsibilities of being named as an author and also in corresponding author because they have to sign the agreement on behalf of all the authors. They have to ensure that all the authors listed are agreeing and have reviewed and agreed to any changes in the manuscript at any stage. And that all relevant declarations on funding and competing interests of the various authors has been listed on the article. Also, with regards to data integrity, it is very important to store original data. And if it is figures and images, then they should be properly labeled and stored because it's not only during the peer review process that somebody might say, oh, I want to take a look at the raw data. Could you kindly provide it? It might be that there is a concern raised in the article after it's published. And somebody wants, you know, the journal or the um, editors might come back and say, actually, we want to take a look at the original data. So it's imperative that original data is stored and labeled in an appropriate manner. And if there are participants, if there are data sets involving participants, then we have to make sure that they have been anonymized so that they're not re-identified using the data set in, in such conditions. Um, then it is important that when you're submitting to a particular journal, you have to, you should uh, read up on the journal's requirements. Some journals mandate that you need to submit certain documents while submission, say for example, uh, they might ask you to deposit your data in a few, you know, uh, in a list of uh, recognized uh, repositories. They might ask you for, they have might have mandatory data sharing policies. Um, they might have other instructions for the author. So it is important to go through this when you're submitting to one particular journal. Um, and with regards to ethics, then it needs to be specified if ethics was state, ethics or ethical approval was taken. If it was not taken and you received a waiver, uh, then that needs to be stated, which institute granted it, what's the ID, if that's available. Um, and if there is any informed, if there are human participants, then whether consent was taken or not, if taken, how was it recorded, if it, uh, and if identifying features are present in the article, then you have to state that whether consent to publish was taken from the participants, who funded the trial, or who funded the research. And, you know, acknowledge anyone, like I said, if you have taken help of a third party to do some kind of data acquisition or analysis, or if you've taken help of somebody to translate the article or write the article, then the, that needs to be stated as well. And you know, just check your manuscript so that when you're when you're drafting your manuscript, if they just before you submit, just check it through, authenticate or turn it in to see that there is no uh, text overlap with any published material. Cite all appropriate sources that you think are relevant for your study. Um, if there are any full versions of the article, like I said, you know, when your article is de um, deposited at a university repository or a preprint server, then that needs to be stated. If it is a, uh, if this was presented at a conference, that needs to be stated. And if you're reusing figures or data from any other manuscript, then you have to take into account whether you have ac adequate permissions or you have you taken permissions from the original article to reuse them in your article. Uh, and I would like to thank you for your attention, um, uh, um, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atul. Very much appreciated. It was not only informative, but um, uh, also I think we learned quite a bit about how to avoid um, uh, pitfalls that uh, might have been thought otherwise, you know, in, in previous years. And uh, all these pieces of information are actually to the benefit of those who would like to publish in um, open access journals, uh, books, and um, magazines. So basically, it has been super useful. Thank you so much. We do have two questions. And I'm just wondering how to actually frame this. It might be a good idea to, to wait for the next presentation and do the Q&A at the end. Okay, so let's just do that. Thank you for the questions, dear audience. 
I really would like to ask you to submit more questions. You can get the answers at the end of the webinar. We will leave ample time for that. Right after you hear the presentation uh, from Tomoko Yamanojo Chadris, who will talk about the impact of open science F1000 publication model. Let me just say a few words about Tomoko. She's a business development manager in charge of open research solutions at Taylor and Francis and F1000R. She's been an editor for medical journals and has experience of over 15 years in academic publishing in the academic publishing industry. She's also in charge of F1000, Japan Institutional Gateway, supported by the University of Tsukuba project. Tomoko, if you could please start sharing your slides and then we'll proceed with the webinar. Again, dear audience, please submit your queries in the Q&A box and uh, Tomoko and Atul will respond to them live at the end of our event. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction and thank you very much for inviting us to participate in this prestigious event. I'm Tomoko Yamanojo Childress, a business development manager at F1000 in Tail and Francis Group. And this is my agenda today. Atul has mentioned about ethics and open science in part one, and I'd like to talk about what publishers can do to support research community who actually want to work on open science and uh, people who want to put open science into practice. And I will introduce about F1000 open science publication model. So I'd like to start from reviewing types of fraud and other issues. On the left side, you can see the ethical issues that we as publishers see very often. And if you look at the right side, you will see another set of problems, such as lack of research data to support findings, which makes it difficult to reproduce what's written in the manuscript. And on the second point, uh, what if the research did not produce the positive results? These manuscripts are hard to be accepted in journals and will be what we call research waste. So open science seems to address many of these issues. And again, what is open science? Here's a UNESCO guidelines and probably one of the most famous definitions. The UNESCO definition is really all about making and bringing efficiency in how we do research and how we do science. It's all about delivering impact. So the sustainable development goals are absolutely key here. And it's essential around thinking and making sure that research and science really helps to support human and societal progress. One of the key recommendations in the UNESCO report is the importance of making scientific knowledge openly available, accessible, and reusable for everyone. And open science has a potential to make the scientific process more democratic. And this is exactly what we as publisher F1000 is trying to do. And we are working really, really hard to deliver this. And when we talk about openly available, one of the key things is making that research discoverable and usable by everyone. And now I'd like to introduce F1000. F1000 is an academic publisher. It was founded in 2013, and this year we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. We offer a unique publishing model that's designed to make research findings as accessible, usable, and usable as possible. And we describe ourselves as an open science publisher. F1000 is now under the umbrella of Taylor and Francis Group since 2020 to extend the spectrum of open research and open access offerings that we provide. And now I'd like to go back to the UNESCO guidelines in the actual UNESCO report on open science. And these are recommendations across all aspects of open science. One of the key areas is focusing on the importance of open scientific knowledge sharing. Open sharing knowledge and collaboration as one of the key parts to deliver an open science future for everybody. 
And F1000 develop a publishing model that is really all about making sure that scientific knowledge is open and connected. And in this slide, uh, this is a visual of all the different research venues that F1000 currently offers. We have a portfolio of publishing venues and we work with a number of partners and serve different research communities. And some information on how to access these platforms are indicated in this slide. So I have been talking about making research data or manuscript discoverable and reusable. And I'd like to explain a little bit more why and how. Open science was also a key priority of the G7 uh, summit, which was highlighted this year uh, with the G7 summit in Sendai, Japan. And this is to tackle with global challenges such as climate change and pandemic, uh, AI, wars, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why open science is talked about at the governmental level is to tackle with these global challenges that you cannot solve by one country in your one community. We need to collaborate to tackle these global issues. And one more thing I would like to highlight is that we see a real shift in research culture and how we evaluate research we see the focus is shifting to valuing a diversity of contributions and outputs to research instead of just focusing on matrix such as impact factor and focus on where the research was published, which journal the research was published. So in the slide, you can see two examples here, Koala and Dora, and both with similar foresight on where and what needs changing to help create a more balanced research system and associated culture. And the main purpose is to have more holistic view of research and its value, including drive to more open and collaborative ways of working as UNESCO is advocating. And you, in this slide, you can see so many logos there are lots of drivers helping drive open science, drive to um, discoverability. There are lots of push and sit and pulls. And the most important thing is uh, there's lots of new ways of how research is discovered and shared, and it's changing really, really fast, driven by technologies. There are also lots of policy drivers to open science, and the UNESCO guidelines are one of those but there are lots of governmental and research organization driven policy reports and guidelines that are really changing the requirements for researchers to share their work, and especially if they are funded by public funds. So how are we going to make research data available for reuse? I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, F1000 uh, data policy. We have fair data policy, which is as open as possible, as closed as necessary. We have an open data policy, which makes the research that we publish usable and available for reuse for others. We essentially mandate and require that research data needs to be shared and be open. However, if there are sensitive data underpinning research, we make sure that we have appropriate safeguards in place so that the research is used through permissions only. And I hear from many researchers uh, around their concerns around making their you know, research data open. Research data is a really hard in life of your research. And I understand that there might be some concerns around making your research data open. Uh, but you have to know the you know, appropriate guidelines. You have to know what should be open, what should not be open. So if you have any questions uh, about making the data open, if you have any challenges, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to us and you know, uh, ask us questions. I think this is really important. And the other thing that we're doing and many publishers are working on is to make research more connected and more discoverable uh, using persistent identifiers you can see in the slide. You can see identifiers such as DOIs, ORCID IDs, funding and granting information using CrossRift and Ringgold for institutions. 
and there's a lots of data emerging now that if you're showing that if you share your data, it delivers you a citation advantage. And this is just one example of that. So it means that if you share your data, there's lots of evidence now to show that your research will be subsequently by use by others because it's more transparent. So if your research piece is more transparent, it's more usable and it's everything more accessible. And now I'd like to um, introduce some of our collaboration with partners. F1000 has been focusing on the value of partnerships in driving open science. It's absolutely core to open science to get feedback from the communities and the partners we work with to make sure that we can then adapt and develop our publishing systems to support those needs directly. And one of the key things why choose F1000? Uh, one of the keys uh, is the variety of article types. F1000 offers a really wide range of article types across supporting all types of research cycle and at different career stages. And in collaboration with our clients and in response to the evolving needs of research and science more broadly, we regularly review and adapt the article option that we make available for authors. And then finally, I'd like to introduce some of our portfolio. F1000 has just launched a new partnership with the American Nuclear Society, which is really, really exciting. They have a number of journals with uh, Taylor and Francis already, mainly subscription-based journals. And the society wanted to step into open science space and do something more future-facing and more open and compatible with open science. And various article types are one of the attractive points for the society. And you can see in the slide uh, the motivation why ANS um, decided to open up F1000 platform. It's uh, article diversity options. It's the society interest in providing sustainable open access research publishing. It's extending publishing options for society members and community, for example, to publish conference proceedings. And now I'd like to introduce our uh, Welcome Open Research. The second example is uh, Welcome Open Research owned by Welcome. And they are a large biomedical funder based out of London and they fund international research all over the world. And we have set up something very similar to um, Gates Foundation, which I will introduce to you later. And this platform was started in 2017, and this was actually our first platform venue partnership. And again, it's an independent platform. It's welcome owned publishing venue. So welcome open research uh, has its own unique ISSN. In this case, the eligibility, also eligibility is if you have a welcome grant, at least one of the author has a welcome grant, uh, you can just publish on this platform. It's been indexed in PubMed, Scorpus, and DOAJ, and lots of other places. And it is actually one of the top publishing venues for welcome grantees. And why would the welcome do this? So as I mentioned, there's a lot of variety in article types. This was very attractive to them. And as a funder, they had to reduce research waste and deliver impact and return on investment for funder. And now I'm very excited to uh, introduce Gates Open Research. So we started a partnership with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2018 and F1000 have a publishing venue designed entirely for the Gates Foundation. And they have their own publishing venue, uh, you can see on the screen, and it's got its own ISSN, as well as Welcome Open Research. And I think the most important thing is, um, again, they were really attracted by the article types diversity, and it has a, the platform has the ability to publish policy documents and of grant reports and gray literature uh, which means you can't find an article type in like a traditional journals, 
but they could publish these uh, research, very important research they funded on gate open research. So again, this is to reduce research waste, deliver impact and return on investment for funder. It's really important. And now I'm very pleased to introduce our partnership with European Commission. Open Research Europe is another independent platform owned by European Commission. And you can see that the also eligibility is Horizon 2000, uh, 2020 and Horizon Europe Research Grantees. And it's indexed in the OAJ PubMed Scopus. And again, the motivation is uh, it's aligned to European Commission's open access policy. It's very cost effective open access. And they were interested in experimental open research publishing model route for pu rapid publication to accelerate potential impact. So again, this is to reduce research waste and deliver impact. And then uh, before I finish, I just wanted to also show a different way in which we work with partners. We also offer organizations the ability to sponsor and have a space on their platform. The Japan Institutional Gateway is hosted in F1000 Research Platform, launched in 2019 originally, and it was rebranded uh, last year. And this is supported by the University of Tsukuba. Now it has three institutions joined as affiliates and they have their own space on this gateway to publish their open research output. And I hear that Many institutions and university, uh, they know about open science, they know about open access, but they didn't know how to practice it and experience it. But through this affiliate program and through this project, the institutions located in Japan can actually practice and experience open science, which is really, um, really exciting. And it offers a dual language publishing. So if it's an uh, article related to HSS research, then you can even publish in Japanese. So it's a really um, extremely rare venue that you can publish Japanese articles as open access. And if you want to know about Japan Institutional Gateway, please feel free to contact me anytime. And if we have time, I am really interested to hear from the audience that what are the challenges when you challenge open? I hear that uh, it's a world trend, open science is a world trend, open access is a world trend, but when you challenge open, uh, you have to pay APC, you have to have, maybe you have, you need time to make the research data open. So there might be lots of challenges, but uh, we're really keen to hear those challenges and answer all the questions so we can help you challenge open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomoko. You have touched upon so many aspects of um, uh, open access publishing and various opportunities. I'm sure the audience has uh, lots of questions. Five of them have taken the opportunity to actually type up uh, their queries in the Q&A box. So let me just uh, relay them to you and a tool one by one. Uh, I believe the first questions might have been addressed at all. So does, uh, well, do blog posts consider are considered as publication if we submit full length articles to journals and publish some parts of these as a blog? What is the scenario in this condition? I think in this condition, it's still, I, it, it, it should be, it should be, like I said, um, when I was talking about when this would be okay is you have to be transparent with the journal that you're submitting to. So if it's a blog post that, and you have submitted the whole article to a journal, but part of it has been posted on a blog, then that needs to be, uh, you know, the journal needs to know that you have posted this as part of the blog that, you know, the full scale article has been submitted, but we talked about this topic. So I think the same thing would apply as to, um, you know, um, data abstracts presented conference. I think it would be the same scenario. Thank you so much. The next question is, what is the timeline for retraction of a research paper? Do only original research papers, are, um, so are original research papers retracted or any type of publication can be retracted, um, such as opinion-based review, et cetera, which is not an original research. 
retraction uh, of a particular article is really dependent upon it, 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 it is case by case basis. You can't really set up a definitive timeline that within seven days, an article will be retracted. You can't because each article is different. Each article has its own investigation that needs to be carried out. So it, you really can't put a number on it. We try to do uh, invest because we have to do due diligence before we decide on retraction of an article because it's a permanent thing. And it's not just correction of, or it's just not uh, updating the scholarly record or correcting the scholarly record, but you have to understand that there's a human being at the end of that paper. And when you retract an article, that impacts them as well. They, you know, might have an uh, emotional impact on them and might have an academic impact on them. So you have to be really careful when we take those decisions. Um, and coming to the next part of the question, um, you know, some it, it's not only original research papers that are retracted. Sometimes, you know, reviews or opinion pieces might get retracted. But then again, it depends upon the content, depends upon what has been said, whether those statements are accurate. I personally have dealt with a case where it was a review article, but unfortunately they were using images, they were, they were using images uh, which, you know, they had used the same image in two different places, highlighting completely different things. And they were not able to provide any sort of justification why the two images were the same. So it, again, like I said, depends upon the content of the article. It is true that we see more and more of uh, original research papers getting retracted and the other scenario is limited, but it still, it does happen. It's not like it doesn't happen, but it's rare. Thank you so much. Well, the third question, as mentioned, some articles do not have sufficient data to support the findings, but somehow the authors want to make it published for any reason and getting rejections from publishers. So if they just reprint, preprint, and then start submitting to journals, even the insufficient data. So in this scenario, what publishers do, especially in open access, do they just accept money and publish like MDPI or something else? Could you please explain that? Atul, can you take this one? Yep. Sure, yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, please, can you take this one up? Yeah, you're muted, Atul, sorry. I said, go ahead, no problem. You can take this one, no problem. Oh, no, please take this one. I, I would like to answer the next one, so. Okay, sure. So with regards to, with regards to, uh, you know, if if what we do at Taylor and Francis, I can't speak for any other publishers, but what we do at Taylor and Francis is that when an article is submitted to us, we look and we analyze the, our editorial teams take a look at it in depth, try to analyze that whatever they are saying with all the conclusions and hypotheses that have been put forward in the article, they're backed by data. They're backed by all the evidence that the authors have provided. And if the, the conclusions are not backed by data, if the data is insufficient, either we ask the authors to provide more data as part of the review process, you know, the reviewer might say, I don't think this is enough, you need to provide this evidence. And unfortunately, if they can't provide the evidence and the article ends up getting rejected. But we, we try our level best to, to make sure that the articles or the content that we publish are backed by sufficient data. I don't know whether that answers the question, but yeah. Thank you very much. If um, well, if the attendee doesn't uh, um, find this enough, I'm sure that we can actually redirect some queries by email later. So um, whoever asked this question, if you still need further clarifications, please send us an email and we'll do our best to help. Next question, Tomoko, you said that you're going to answer this one. So as you mentioned in your slide, uh, that because of open science, you support DRA and uh, CO area. Um, and so why the journals promoting themselves as high impact factor journals, including Taylor, what is more important, impact factor or open research? Hmm. I think it's really understandable, really good question. As, uh, as I mentioned, Taylor and Francis acquired uh, F1000 to expand, extend the spectrum of open research and op access solution. And there is a certain need for, you know, impact factor journals. You, if you have your community has a need to publish in traditional publication, Taylor and Francis can offer it. But it's true that there's a new trend coming in Europe or United States or other parts of the world 
to have a different idea and then uh, we have to answer to those you know movement or problems or issues or in the for of the request from the market and then we have f1000 so i think f1000 is just one option that we added and then so researchers can actually choose so if you cannot provide you know multiple solutions we cannot um you know provide really suitable solutions in each community each region each uh area so i think uh i can say that it's now we have a variety of solutions and f1000 is one of the solutions we can provide as tell and francis group so it's i'm sorry it's a long answer but it's the image is like it's a Taylor and Francis group like a big umbrella and we have many brands and solutions under the um, umbrella. I hope this answers to your question. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. We still have three questions. Um, next one. I believe these ethical principles apply to both natural and social scientists, although they may be more relevant to natural scientists. What are some common misconducts or mistakes that researchers in humanities and social science, sciences often encounter? Um, yeah, that is true that we tend to see more, more of these, uh, you know, how do I say, more of uh, problems or issues cropping up in natural sciences, as you said, in STEM, rather than in humanities and social sciences but that's not to say that we don't see any issues in that discipline as well where there are some things which crop up now and again quite often in humanities say for example like i said inappropriate authorship changes they might have a problem there there might be substantial text overlap uh, there might be what we call which i didn't discuss in my talk something called as plagiarism of ideas where we receive a complaint which the crux of that is that their hypothesis or their idea or their thought process had been hijacked by someone else and they have published a paper. They might provide you with some sort of proof that this is the statement that we, we made and they are saying the same thing. It's they've just twisted the words, but the philosophy or the thought process behind that is exactly the same. So those are really difficult to deal with because for dealing with those kind of scenarios, it's not about you know just using a software and checking, oh, there's an overlap and that's it. Do you have to be, you have to, I mean, we really depend upon our, our um, editorial boards because they are the ones who are subject matter experts. So they need to look into the article and, and say that whether, you know, is it possible for two individuals to come up with the same idea in the field? Is the field that big enough that they can, you know, the probability of those two events happening is is true, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, accurate, or is it that no, it can't be possible that, you know, the two people came up with the same idea or the idea was already there and they have simply hijacked. So I think it's more on those lines. And obviously, what would I would like to also mention here that in sometimes in humanities and social sciences, you do encounter, you know, surveys or questionnaires handed out to individuals or human, or human participants sometimes and you have taken their feedback. And in those scenarios, it might be important to see whether there was any ethical oversight or there was any, you know, consent they can do. Sometimes you might have a survey done, but the people might be, you know what, I don't want this going out and being published. I don't want my opinions to be published anywhere, even if it is anonymized. So in those scenarios, ethical, ethical approval, informed consent, uh, and, you know, especially with regards to plagiarism of ideas, text overlap, those are the issues that we tend to see more often in social sciences and humanities. Thank you so much. We still have a few questions left and we are running out of time. So I'm going to read them out relatively fast. I think APC is a big challenge for developing and underdeveloped countries. Making data public is not a problem. So what is your take? We provide waivers to uh, such countries and Atul, do you have anything to add? Um, as far as I know, as far as I know, with regards to APCs, I think there are, like you said, there are waivers provided to countries, um, you know, who, where they might not be able to, might not be able to provide the complete APC and their waivers there. But I think um, my knowledge in that field is limited. Yes, and in Japan, we're trying to really help researchers and research communities, um, and we're having conversation with many funders. So in the future, I think with the 
the collaboration with funders, I think we might be able to uh, provide some solutions per region because the situation around funds is so different per region to region. So I mean, yeah, that's the answer for me. And about the last question, I think it takes a really long time to answer this. So if possible, may I reply to the last question through emails? Yeah, so the last question, again, just uh, to those who uh, have not clicked, how is the peer review process conducted on these new platforms that specifically aim to reduce research waste? So Tomoko will be answering that um, later by email. I presume we are going to actually post that on our portal. So in order to make that visible to whoever is interested. Okay, any other questions? We still can handle one question before we say goodbye. And um, I would like to thank our speakers for the wealth of information they have provided and for our attendees to have made it this far. Any other questions? Okay, well, in that case, uh, thank you for attending today's event. I would like to especially thank our speakers for taking the time to provide us all these pieces of um, information and uh, helping us understand open access publishing and uh, various processes that actually help researchers to get there. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also on the Eurocentric Japan portal. Please follow us, uh, email us, and check out our upcoming events as well. We still hope to have um, some events with Taylor and Francis this year. So please tune in at the later webinars as well. Thank you for coming and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>